In this video, I'd like to follow up the Hello World program example that we created in my part two video with a discussion on class structure. And along the way, we're gonna learn how to make variables. When I talk about class structure, I'm talking about the organizing principles and the stylistic rules that we should be using when we're writing our programs. So let's take a look at a longer example of code. Here I have a class that I wrote called structure example. And a class structure should be in three main parts. At the top of our code is where we declare our variables. And we call those variables fields. But sometimes you might hear the word property associated with them. So a field or a property uh, should be something that sounds like a noun. Uh, for instance, uh, I might have a field name that remembers a person's name or their age. So name or age would be uh, variables that sound like nouns. Following your variable declarations at the top should be your constructor. So the second section would be any constructors that you have. And you can have more than one, but I have one example here. And a constructor's purpose is to tell the computer how to make a copy of this class in memory, which is known as an object. And then following your constructors are a section of methods, if you have any. And the methods of a class are its behaviors, what it will do. So many of your method names will sound like verbs. Here I have an example, get field var, or print something. So these sound like an action, they sound like a verb. And additionally, you'll notice that I have indentation and spacing going on. So as we begin to write our own classes, I want you to begin to imagine that there are these rectangular boxes around them, these blocks of code that exist in your class. And this is what is going to help you uh, write better code and easier to debug code because it takes on organization. It's not messy. So notice how the contents of the class are all indented because they belong to this outer box of code. And even within these smaller boxes, like the constructor and the methods, I have indented lines of code, like int local var is indented, indicating to the programmer that this belongs to this, bo this box right here. It's been indented as well. Uh, as, as well as this return statement and then this print line statement in uh, print something. So uh, as we uh, write our class, we'll be using it proper indentation, but also between each of these, I also have good spacing. It doesn't cost anything to add a little bit of spacing in between, say, your fields and your constructors and your methods. So uh, you should do that as well. And if I show you a non-example, here is a uh, here's the exact same code without proper spacing and proper indentation. It makes the class harder to read. And as a matter of fact, I could make this code even worse by not having it organized in the same way. I could mix the field variable somewhere in the middle of the code. I could put one of the methods at the top. I could put the constructor last. Those types of things help to take away the predictability of how a class should be written. So if you follow these stylistic rules, it'll be easier to find sections of code, especially when the programs get larger. All right, let's talk about those variables here that I put throughout this example class now. There are three types of variables in programming. You can have a field, you can have a parameter, or you can have a local variable. And here I've put the definitions of what each one actually is. The field variable, also known as a property, can be accessed anywhere within the class. So an example of that was this one right here. I have a private int called a field variable. So an int is something that would be a whole number in the range of uh, negative 2 billion up to positive 2 billion. So uh, it's just a whole number. 
And notice how I named it with a lowercase letter, but as I add additional words to the name, I would capitalize the first letter. This is called camel case. And this is a stylistic convention of naming things. So notice how these field variables are named that way, and so is the methods down here. This is another rule that programmers take into account when they're writing in Java. As opposed to the class name and the constructors, which are actually matching, those are uppercase. Okay, but back to the list of variables. A parameter is another type of variable, but its values are passed into a method or a constructor. So let me go ahead and find one of those in our example. And here's a parameter down here that I called param. It's a string, which means it's a, uh, a bunch of characters that are uh, strung together. In other words, it could be a word, it could be a sentence. It could be a single character, but uh, a string represents a series of characters. And in this case, I called this variable param. And it would take on the value of whatever method or constructor is calling this method. So uh, that takes us to a local variable. A local variable is something that only exists in a particular method or constructor. So an example of, of a local variable here is I put one in this constructor and I called it local var. So it's an integer and it only exists within this particular constructor. The rest of the program can't even see it. So I should point out at this point, notice how this one takes on a brown color. That's because in Eclipse, local variables will be brown and the field variables are blue. That means that within this method down here, get field var uh, can see or it knows about this field variable. It's shared without, with, uh, within the entire class, whereas local var is not shared. It only exists between lines uh, 7 and 11. That's it. And uh, variables can only be one of those three types, a field, a parameter, or a local variable. Now, in this example over here, none of them are initialized. What does that mean? Well, that means they have not been given an initial value yet. So they are literally just pointing to a place in memory that we've nicknamed with whatever name that we've given them. So field example... Uh, would hold a value of zero because we haven't given it anything. But local variables, they are not initialized with any value whatsoever. So its value would be considered null. In other words, nothingness. Uh, we'll keep that in mind as we now discuss how to declare and initialize. This chart here shows you all of the different parts that go into a statement made to the computer that declares and initializes a variable called number and it gives it the value of a thousand and one to remember. So let me take away all of that extra information and just focus on the statement itself. So here is just one line of Java code that declares this number variable. What it's actually doing is the first word here that you see int is a data type. It's telling the computer how much space to reserve in memory for this variable. And an int takes 32 bits of data. Whereas it could also say Boolean, and that would tell the computer I only need one bit of information to remember this variable. The second word here, number, is the name that I've given to this space in memory. A computer typically refers to these memory locations as either hexadecimal numbers or binary, uh, but that's not a very friendly thing for us as the programmer to deal with. So instead of having to deal with hexadecimal numbers or binary numbers, we can nickname these memory locations something more friendly like number or name or age. And whenever we refer to that name, 
the computer will go to that memory address and find out what's in it. In this case, we want to put some extra information into it. We want to put this literal value, this 1001 value, in this memory location. So that's why this equal sign is actually known as the assignment operator. You are assigning this value to that memory location. So if I go back to my chart over here, uh, I've broken down the data type, the name, the assignment operator, and then this expression that is a value that gets put into this memory slot. So the left-hand side of the equal sign is known as the declaration. The right-hand side is the initialization. In other words, you're giving it an initial value when you are declaring it. Now, optionally, over here, I have something called a modifier. So sometimes you'll see like public or private or protected that precedes a declaration. And that could happen for a field variable. Um, so uh, let me show you an example. Right here, I have a field variable. And I've, uh, well, it's called field example. And it's an integer but it's private, which means that it's not shared with any other program in the class. Whereas down here, local variables, they don't have that modifier. They don't, they're not given that private, public, or protected uh, accessibility. They are only local to the method or constructor that they are in. So from this curly brace to that curly brace, that's the only part of the program that can know about it. And parameters don't take modifiers either. So only field variables. All right, so let's just take a look at a little bit of Java code now here. And this is the Java code that we wrote earlier without any of that proper indentation or spacing. Now, the nice thing about Eclipse is that it will actually format code for you. So if I click in here and I go to source and I click format, or I could push control shift F, it will format it for me the way that it should be formatted. So this is considered standard format. And uh, it cleans it up for me. Now just to show you a little bit more about this private, public, and protected uh, modifier that is in front of some of these things. Let me show you how I would test run this class. So over here I've created a test structure example. So this is a second class and it contains a main method. And in my part two video I told you that the main method is the starting point of your program. It tells the computer start executing in the first statement that you find in the main method, which would be this line of code that I put right here. So what I'm going to use this to show you is how uh, the public and private and protected modifiers back in this class either expose uh, information to the other class or hide it. So here the field example is a private variable, so it's not shared. And the get field var is public, so this class will be able to see it. And this one is protected, which means that classes that extend upon uh, structure example can see it, but other classes can't. So let's go ahead and show you how that works. This line of code creates a variable called structure. And structure's data type is the name of our class. So uh, this tells the computer you're going to need to kind of analyze this code over here in this class and determine how much space that takes to save and then reserve that much space. Anytime I need to know what's in it, I'm going to refer to it as structure. That's the nickname for that location in memory. Now initially, in other words, to initialize that space in memory, we're going to put a new copy of structure example. So this is going to call its default no args constructor. So notice how uh, these parentheses are empty. That means go over here, find the constructor that doesn't have anything in it. Like down here, there is stuff between the parentheses. This one's empty, so that makes this a no args constructor. And then do whatever this tells you to do.
So this basically went over here and put an initial value in this variable called structure. Now on the next line, we can change that, uh, that object in memory like this. I could use the name of the variable and put a dot. This is known as a name dot prefix. And now this tells me everything that I can either access or do to this memory location. In other words, this class or this object in memory. Now most of these say dash object after them. And that's because everything in Java is an object. Object is the overall class that everything extends from. So you're always going to have things like your toString method or your equals method uh, available to you. But the two that are interesting to us right now are the ones that say dash structure example. These are the custom things that we wrote in our class, like get field var. It returns an integer. Um, the print something method is a void, and it takes a string called param. So let's go ahead and use that one right here. But notice how we couldn't access or even know about field example. Field example was nowhere in that list because it's private. So anytime you see the private keyword, that means it's a secret. It's not shared with the rest of the program. So back over here, we have to fill in a blank here. It's expecting a string. So actually, let me take this back out here and show that to you again. So the print something method, it tells me here that the proper way to do this is to put in a string put in a series of characters that represent like a word or a sentence or even a single character or just an empty string. So I could put in something like this and that would fulfill it. That's an empty string. It just happens to have nothing in it. I could put in a single character like uh, I. But in this case, I, I'm going to put in a phrase, hello world, just like I did in my part two video. And this fulfills the string requirement that is called param that this method over here is expecting. So now that we've actually done something, let's go ahead and run this class. So here the program is going to create a copy of structure in memory. So here it gets initialized with that. We can refer to structure in memory and do all of its uh, methods that are public or protected, um, and we can access any public properties that it has, which are none. So let me go ahead and push play, and up pops Hello World. Okay, so this concludes our lesson on class structure and variable declarations.